Every living organism requires energy. You gotta eat. If you recall from last time, this unit is about ecology, which is the study of the relationships between organisms and their surroundings. Our last topic was specifically about how organisms acquire energy and the different classification of organisms based on where organisms get their energy. We learned about species, populations, communities, and ecosystems. Lastly, we learned about how ecosystems can be studied on small scale by creating a mesocosm. We also learned about how the relationships organisms have in an ecosystem can be studied by doing a chi-squared analysis. That is our background knowledge as we move on to 4.2, which is about the flow of energy through the ecosystem. Our essential idea here is that ecosystems require a continuous supply of energy to fuel life processes and to replace energy lost as heat. In the images here, we have a food web and a trophic level pyramid. Maybe these folks look familiar to you. By the end, you should be able to have a better understanding of both of these. Remember what an autotroph is? Well, if not, it's an organism that produces the energy and organic molecules needed to live. Autotrophs make their own energy. They are self-nourishing. But this energy comes from somewhere, right? Most autotrophs get their energy from the sun, as they are photoautotrophs. They get this energy through the process of photosynthesis, where light energy from the sun is converted in the plant to chemical energy. The process of photosynthesis is the main mechanism that carbon enters the biological cycle, and plants convert carbon dioxide in water, which are inorganic molecules, into sugar and oxygen, where sugar is organic. This sugar is used by the plant for energy. When a heterotroph trope consumes these plants, they use the carbon to help create their own chemical energy, which is in the form of adenosine triphosphate, better known as ATP. For ecosystems that do not have sunlight as their source of energy, we have chemoautotrophs that use other chemicals to derive their energy. We also have mixotrophs, which can use both methods depending on which is most efficient. Once the energy gets in the ecosystem, it gets transferred between the organisms. You have probably heard of a food chain, which is the sequence of organisms in a habitat beginning with the producer, in which which each obtains nutrients by eating the organism preceding it. The example here shows the carrot plant, which is the f autotroph or producer, and then the heterotroph herbivore is the rabbit. The rabbit gets eaten by the carnivore feral cat, and that in turn gets eaten by the red fox. In this chain, the energy starts from the sun, goes into the carrot plant, then to the rabbit, then to the cat, and then the fox. Food chains show a very linear relationship about how energy flows. Below the food chain, you can see a much more complex image. This is a food web. In it, there are many interconnected food chains. Each organism in a food web or food chain occupies a certain place within each feed sequence. This is called the trophic level. In the food chain at the top, the carrot plant is the first trophic level, which is the producer. The primary consumer, or second trophic level, is the rabbit. The secondary consumer, or third trophic level, is the cat. And the tertiary consumer, or fourth trophic, trophic level, is the fox. In any food web or food chain, there are arrows. Notice that the arrow is pointing in the direction of the way the energy is being transferred. In the food chain, the arrow is pointed to the rabbit, representing the energy being transferred from the carrot to the rabbit. If we look closer at the food web, we can actually make our own food chains. On the left side, you see various trophic levels. You will notice that some organisms occupy multiple trophic levels. To highlight one such example, the phytoplankton are the primary producers, and they are eaten by the benthic macroinvertebrates. This energy transfers from the phytoplankton to the benthic macroinvertebrates. Those get consumed by sea ducks, who in turn get consumed by the bald eagle. Notice there are only four trophic levels in this food chain. Let's look at another example. In this example, the producers are on the left side. The trophic level key is on the bottom. You can see that once again, we can make multiple food chains. Depending on the organism that you choose, you might go straight from water weed, which is the producer, to the turtle, which in this case would be a primary consumer. However, turtles can also be secondary consumers. If you look at the kingfisher all the way to the right side, that could be anywhere from a secondary to a quaternary consumer. So there are many food chain combinations that you can make, and many different trophic levels that some organisms can occupy. In all of them, there is always a primary producer that gets its energy from the sun, and the arrows always, always represent the flow of energy from one trophic level into the next. Is the transfer of energy efficient as we move up trophic levels? The short answer is not at all. In fact, it is very inefficient, and most of the energy leaves the system. As we stated before, all organisms require energy. Living organisms have to make new organic compounds. They have to physically move around, and they have to regulate their body temperature. These metabolic processes and growth in homeostasis all require energy. As we talked about before, in all heterotrophs, ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is the main source of energy 
energy to fuel these reactions. ATP is formed during cellular respiration and requires glucose. This chemical reaction produces heat, so it is an exothermic reaction. This heat gets released from the organism. For you or me, we're constantly releasing heat and we stay about 37 degrees Celsius. It would be really great if heterotrophs could use this heat energy for something, but we cannot and it's lost to the atmosphere. Let's look at the cow in the example. The inputs, which is everything the cow consumes, represents 100%, and that's in green. Of that 100%, 25% is stored in the cow, 25% is used during cell respiration to make ATP, 40% is lost as heat, and the final 10% is lost as waste products or fecal matter. Overall, 25% is very efficient for an organism. Let's look closer at the other diagram. At the top, you can see all of the input from the solar energy. This energy is transferred to chemical energy in producers. At each level, from the producer to top carnivores and even the decomposers, there's energy that gets lost in the form of heat. That heat energy goes one place only, to the atmosphere and space. Living organisms cannot turn this heat into other forms of usable energy. This heat energy is released from the organism and is lost from the ecosystem. Unlike nutrients, which are recycled. Hence, ecosystems require a continuous influx of energy from an external source, such as the sun. This has a huge impact on ecosystem and the size that food chains can be. To put the numbers on this, roughly 10% of energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next. So the carrot plant represents 100 units of energy. The rabbit that consumes it, only 10% is transferred, leaving 10% of the original energy. The cat that consumes the rabbit, only 10% is transferred and now just 1% of the initial energy remains. When the fox eats the cat, 10% of that energy is transferred, and this just represents 0.1% of the original energy. As you can tell, there's not much of the initial energy remaining. At some point, because energy and biomass is lost between each level of the food chain, the number of potential trophic levels get limited. First, higher trophic levels receive less energy and biomass from feeding, and so organisms need to eat larger quantities to obtain sufficient amounts. Because higher trophic levels need to eat more, they expend more energy and biomass hunting for food. Ultimately, if the energy required to hunt food exceeds the energy available from the food eaten, the trophic level becomes unviable. You can see another example in the image below. In this image, do not be fooled by the unit change from liters to milliliters. And remember that we have 1,000 milliliters in one liter. The final trophic level represents 0.001% of the initial energy in the ecosystem. One skill that you need to know how to do is describe the shape and units of a pyramid of energy and be able to draw a pyramid of energy given data for an ecosystem. A pyramid of energy is a graphical representation of the amount of energy at each trophic level of a food chain. They're represented in units of energy per area time, kilojoules per square meter per year. And also, they can be put in joules. These graphical representations are drawn to scale. The details matter. In the example here, you have the sun, the daisy, the snail, the frog, and the fox. As the daisy is the primary producer, the energy it has represents 100% in that food chain. Specifically, it receives 10,000 joules. The snail is the primary consumer. Between the daisy and the snail, there's a 10% energy transfer of the original amount. So the energy left for the daisy would be 1,000. Where does the other 90% go? Remember that it's lost as heat and waste products or used in homeostasis. Moving to our secondary consumer, the frog, he consumes the snail and only 10% of the 1,000 joules is transferred. So the frog is left with 100 joules of energy available. Lastly, the fox eats the frog and just 10% of that energy is transferred, leaving only 10 joules. Some things to notice here include the 10% efficiency, the pyramid that is drawn to scale, and the units of energy. These are all super important. We will be spending some time practicing making these in class. You should also know how to interpret these energy pyramids and understand the way that they work. That wraps up topic 4.2 on energy flow. You can see how this and 4.1 are very related and there are many terms that you need to know how to use and discuss. So keep yourself woke and go watch a nature documentary from David Attenborough. As always, it's really important to give credit where it's due. While the presentation script and video are solely of my own creation, many of the images and information contained in the presentation are not. So shout outs to the following. Most of the images and video clips come from Ivy Bio Ninja, as well as some of the information used. Other images and info come from Bionology, iBiology, and Biology for Life. Lastly, some information was gleaned from the Cambridge edition of the Ivy Biology text. 
as the intended purpose of this presentation is to provide you with yet another resource tool to enhance your learning for the IB Biology curriculum. So thank you.